Okay, I just want to give a shout out to a friend of mine, Boris, who's uh, one of my friends on, uh, he's got a site on, U on uh, YouTube called Natural Australian Turquoise 6166. It's uh, a wealth of information about Australian minerals and rocks and he's been all over the US and he knows all about that sort of stuff. Kent might like some of that stuff and give him some info because he knows bloody <laughs> everything, doesn't he? Yeah, not like me, I'm a bloody ignoramus. <laughs> All right, now where were we in my story? Oh, Wednesday Kennedy, if you're listening, I'd like to come round your place. I left you a message on, uh, on your uh, email, uh, if you like. Or you can put it up for a week, I don't care, whatever. Whatever you like, all right? Because it's hard to get me out of here. I really like living here. I don't have to do nothing to please anybody. It's great. Mm. All right. My mate David Ladd, we scrounged dough to get into Wavell Auditorium Rock Show, the American Spectacular Tour of 1960, featuring Dwayne Eddy, Johnny Restivo, Crash Craddock, The Diamonds, Santa and Johnny. And then a few weeks later, I snuck into my auntie's house and stole three bucks to get into Lloyd Price, Conway Twitty, the Callan Twins, Johnny Reb and the Rebels. They're an Australian group. They were really great. They had a great rock song called Hey, 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 Sheriff. Uh, and Dig Richards was on the bill also but i didn't dig him anyway my kind old grandmother that looked after me she seemed to enjoy housework hang on i gotta move the page fucking hell uh yeah yeah uh my grandfather was a big strong man and he'd rescued grandma from a nasty husband and she'd run away with grandpa and they ran a fish shop in north sydney when they were younger. And when the Harbour Bridge was planned, they were forced to sell the land to the government and they used the money to buy an Adelaide fish shop in Henley Beach. And in 1944, they sold the business and retired to Marlston and then later on to Henley Beach. Anyway, 1961, I turned 17 and I'd not even learned to wash dishes or make uh, make my own bed, you know. I didn't have to do anything. My grandparents spoiled me rotten. But then again, I didn't, uh, you know, they didn't have to look after me much. All, all they did was give me one meal a day, but that was good enough. Hang on, where's I lost my page? Bloody hell. Where's my bloody page? Oh, bloody hell. Lucky we've got plenty of time, haven't we? We've got another 50 years to live, haven't we? Yeah, no worries. <laughs> oh, fuck, where were we? Oh, yeah, here we go. We're getting near it. Fucking hell, I've got to scroll down for hours. Right, here we go. Yeah, you see, my grandfather. Yeah, no, I, I, my grandmother, one day my grandma, I used to do the shop. I, they'd send me to the shop and I always did the shopping for them. Uh, that was my way of repaying them for looking after me and buying my school uniform and that. And buying my school books. You had to buy school books in those days. You didn't get them free like nowadays. I, one day, Grandma sent me to buy vegetables from Mrs Mossman's Fruit and Veg in Henley Beach. And on a bench in the store lounged a trio that I'd seen in school. Joe and Laurie Lorenzo Spazzano had hair like Elvis, so I figured they were okay. The third guy, Glenn Hutchins, known as Bubba Louie, looked a bit like James Dean. So sitting in Mosman's shop window, sipping on a Coke for two hours, became my new hobby. So I gave up sports and just hung out. The Spazzano's present parents were Italian and warned them don't go around with that sneaky Aussie kid he's a no good for nothing 
And my granny warned me, keep away from those Italians. They're not like us. Grandma also warned me of the dangers of living on a hill. She'd say, never marry a Catholic. If you do, then one day they'll march up the hill to your house and take your wife away. Funny about that, most of my girlfriends were once Catholic. The only time I lived on a hill was with two lesbians, but no one marched up the hill and took them. Georgie Nikoloff, I wonder if you're still alive, Georgie, or if you've been killed by some husband. Georgie Nikoloff was good looking, oh, the best looking kid you can imagine, handsomer than you can even imagine, and he got lots of girls. So he didn't hang around with us much, and I was glad because none of us had a chance once a girl met Georgie, but we admired his pickup lines. If he saw a girl running, he'd walk up next to her and say, Don't run, gorgeous. Call St. George's. St. George's was a taxi company in Adelaide. And if she was walking, he'd say, You're too beautiful to walk alone. Anyway, we'd spit every so often to make us look confident, like baseball players in movies. Georgie Nikoloff could spurt an artistic jet through his two front teeth that we called the Nikoloff Guzzi. It shot long and narrow, and I couldn't do it until I'd practised. At first, it dribbled down your Canadian jacket. A Canadian jacket was what you got for Christmas if your parents wouldn't get you a real leather one. They came in sickly green or more on maroon. Mine was green. It lost shape and it hung on my bony shoulders like a dishcloth. And the fact that I managed to get a girl despite wearing that lousy jacket every damn day caused me to believe I was hot stuff. Nearby lived Hoodlum Bradley and his younger brother, Little Hoodlum. Big Hoodlum had had a shower with a girl, so he was the most experienced kid that we knew. I always hoped he'd not notice me. He had a tough reputation ever since he kicked out two palings of a lady's picket fence. Yeah, none of us had a car. We were 16 by now. None of us had a car. Only bicycles with big, giant motorcycle handlebars. We'd say, we don't need a car to get dames. Yeah. Chuck McCullough wouldn't get dames at all if he didn't have his old man's car. Chuck and his brother John joined us when we climbed the fence of the Blue Line drive-in movie. John's nickname was Shave because he didn't yet. We'd sit in the playground below the screen and crane our necks up at the drive-in, uh, hang on, in winter we took blankets like American Indians on the reservation and pretend that one of us was carrying a little baby wrapped in a blanket and on the way to the drive-in walking we'd drop the baby oh, and make a big deal about the terrible injuries and then we'd fight and push and and blame each other and ignore the kid on the ground and still, until someone stepped on it and it died. Or we'd yell, oh, the baby shit itself, bad baby, and beat it with a stick. <laughs> and when it looked like uh, some adult was going to rescue it, we'd show it was just a blanket <laughs> and strut away thinking that we're so cool. We spent a lot of time trying to be cool. At Henley High School, two kids got married and held hands a lot. To me, they were the happiest kids in the world, and I longed to be in a similar relationship. Cute feminine Lynn Mahoney looked like Cindy Williams, the prom queen in American Graffiti. And as she walked home, I approached and tried to channel Elvis. I said... I'd sure like to get you, get to know you better. Okay, she answered. My mind blanked out from excitement. I had a reputation as a delinquent. I didn't want her to think I was a goody-goody, so I suggested maybe you could come over to my joint one day and play records. 
Fortunately, I didn't finish with in my bedroom. Lynn was diplomatic. I tried to show I was a normal type person by saying, you could come over and meet my grandparents. Lynn was diplomatic. She said, yes, that might be okay. She disappeared up her driveway and I crossed the street thinking, well, at least I had the guts to talk to her. She was too classy for me and we never spoke again. I wonder what your life's been like, Lynn. Where are you tonight? I hope you're okay. Down the street from me lived 16-year-old Wayne Basto. I don't know why, but he insisted that I call him Bull's Wool. He was a good fighter and he taught me wrestling holds occasionally, but mostly he liked to play with wine bottle corks that I think he got from his plonk-loving parents. Plonk is an, is an Australian term for wine. He invented a game where we'd each grab a cork and throw them at the, each cork at each other inside a wrestling ring drawn on the ground, and we threw until the two corks hit each other, even if it took a hundred throws. The cork that bounced furthest was the winner, because obviously it was the stronger. He had given each of his corks a name, e.g. Bullcrap, Bugaloo Bear, Hopscotch Louie, Nasty Nugget, etc., etc. And he remembered how many wrestling matches each cork had won. I think he kept a notebook, yeah, and he rewarded the best cork by allowing it to reside in his top pocket. And when he got older, he said he was going to join the Navy, and I don't know if he took his corks along, but I know he got in because I found him on fa on uh, I found him on Facebook. <laughs> I found Wayne Basto on Facebook uh, sixty years later, and uh, he he did get into the navy. So you know he wasn't. <laughs> Those corks paid off. Uh, what's next? Hang on, we're go we're going to finish soon. I can't go on forever. Margie Caldwell was short, a tiny bit chubby, but not much, and competed in swimming events. The public pool where she trained was turning her short blonde hair yellowish green. She was painfully shy, and she had a sad look, so I figured she needed love. I smiled at her, and she said her dad wouldn't let her talk to boys, and that made me care more. One day I saw a riding passenger behind a tough-looking biker. Uh, she was laughing and her arms were wrapped around him, so I gave up on little Margie. Sharon Tanner was new in town. Laurie, my buddy, I didn't, did I tell you about Laurie? They were Italian with slick Elvis, black Elvis hair. But their parents were very strict with them, you know, they didn't let them get away with much. So as soon as they got away from their house, they turned into the worst juvenile delinquents you ever found. So I'll tell you a lot about them later on. One of them got murdered when he was about 20 because he was such a smart ass. Uh, Sharon Tanner, yeah, Laurie was planning to pick her up before the moving truck unloaded. She was new in town, so to get there before him, I ran home and changed into my best clothes and I slicked my hair with Grandpa's Californian poppy and I ran to Sharon's house before Laurie could get there. My confidence began to shrink, so I became Paul Anker for romance and I blended it with the sex appeal of Crash Craddock. Uh, that was like I was a chemist with blending uh, people that I could absorb. I was very chemical in my absorptions. And I said to her, oh, you're new in town, so maybe I could show you around. You know, I had this tough American, almost American, sort of Richard Widmark accent I used to put on sometimes. And she agreed that it was nice of me to offer. So I whispered, gee, Sharon, you're a doll. Sharon must have been lonely because she looked happy and wet her lips. Now, that was a signal that girls give when they want to kiss. 
Tip of tongue wet lipping, lip wetting. <laughs> was sign number three. And I didn't want her to think I was inexperienced, so I stepped close and gently held her and tilted her head up so I could kiss without bumping foreheads. If I missed, she'd think me a novice kisser and tell her friends uh, as soon as she'd made some. <sighs> she smelt great. It was an important moment to, for me. Nothing in the world, in the universe, would ever smell as nice as a close-up girl. Now, I don't mean she smelled great like she, <laughs> like she stunk, but she had a nice, fresh, clean hair sort of smell, that's what I mean. It was a romantic summer evening. I'd been keeping an eye out for her dad because I heard she had a, a tough dad and my mouth touched hers. My lips were slightly open with tongue behind front teeth. I had a musk lifesaver in my mouth. I always had a musk lifesaver in my gob. She'd like that. Some guys kiss with lousy breath. Not me. We kissed softly for about seven seconds. And with a mouth near her ear, I crooned, You're beautiful. I'm nuts about you. Sharon Tanner gave me the most beautiful gift. She said, I'm nuts about you too. My mediocre existence turned on its head and life at last had meaning. We kissed for about five minutes until her dad yelled, Sharon, get your bloody self inside and you, mate, piss off. And she sighed and she looked ashamed of her dad. <laughs> and she said, see you tomorrow. I says, you betcha. Okay, that's all. I went 17 seconds. 17 minutes, yeah, that's all I can go, all right, that's all. I had to put one in because I hadn't done one for two days. I'm going to have a shave tomorrow. I don't want to look too scruffy on a telly, you know. It's bad enough, these little blotches on my skin. That's from sun damage, from always having a suntan when I was young. All right, that's enough about me, all right. Don't forget, it's called a Natural Australian Turquoise 6166, and it's a treasure trove of Australian opals and all sorts of stuff. Yeah. Uh, uh, Kent might like that. 